So what's the most common disease in the United States? What's the most common risk factor for coronary artery disease? What is the strongest indication for diabetes screening for the hemoglobin A1C? What's the most common cause of stroke? It's high blood pressure and hypertension. Hypertension is so common as to essentially almost be usual in the older, particularly obese population. It's the most common risk factor for coronary disease. It's going up and up and up because we're more heavy all the time. We were never meant to be eating this much meat. We are herbivores. We are herbivores masquerading as carnivores. Carnivores have sharp, ripping teeth. Most of our teeth are relatively flat. Grinding teeth. I was with dental residents in the elevator today. And I said, are we herbivores or carnivores? And they go, oh, we're carnivores. And carnivores have sharp, ripping teeth. And the dental residents go, we have sharp, ripping teeth. I'm like, really, Dracula? Is that true? No, we don't. Most of our teeth are grinding flat teeth. Our GI tract is meant to be an herbivore. We have 30 feet of small bowel. That's an herbivore's bowel. We have an herbivore's bowel. We're not omnivores. Herbivores. Herbivores have to live at a low eight, uh, LDL. Low LDL. Carnivores can live. A cheetah can live. A tiger and a lion can live with a high LDL. We die with a high LDL. And that's why hypertension. A man comes to the office and he's got a blood pressure that is 147 over 94. You repeat the blood pressure and you repeat it and you repeat it because we know it takes somewhere between three and six times to reach its steady state. And this is borderline type hypertension. As a matter of fact, if you're over the age of 60, it doesn't even count as hypertension. Because over the age of 60, above the age of six, above the age of 60, the blood pressure cutoff is 150 over 90. Ding, 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 something new for you. Ding, 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 ding. Second thing is, for diabetes, what's the cutoff for high blood pressure? 140 over 90. Changed back to being like everybody else. Ding, 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 JNC8. JNC8. All right, you repeat, you repeat, and you repeat, and now you start lifestyle modifications. And you don't need to go to medical school to say decrease salt, or exercise, or weight loss, or eat vegetables, or relax, don't do it. Okay, relax, weight loss, exercise, decrease the salt, diet changes, even separate from weight loss. The strongest effect upon your ability to control blood pressure is weight loss. For every kilogram you lose, you lose one millimeter of mercury off your blood pressure. If you lose five kilograms, you lose five millimeters of mercury. If you lose 10 kilograms, you lose 10 millimeters of mercury off your blood pressure. And we're heavier and fatter every year. The average American goes up by a quarter pounder each year. That is two to four ounces, four, two to four ounces, four ounces a year because we've never been around such unrelenting food. We are never meant to have eaten this much meat. And the reason that the first, did you know the first year we ever had a myocardial infarction? James Herrick described the first myocardial infarction in Chicago in a stockbroker having sudden death in 1912. Sir William Osler, who started residencies in this country, Osler said that he saw a heart attack is a very, very rare disease that he had been in practice for many, many, many years before he saw his first one. Why? Because he was living at a time in the world when the vast majority of people ate meat once a week or once a month, tops, and they were herbivores. Meat's expensive. So therefore, as we get heavier and heavier and heavier, the most effective lifestyle modification is weight loss. 
the least effective is in fact relaxation because we can't measure it. Me being on camera 24 hours a day, seven days a week is relaxing for me. Now, the next one is when you fail this because only 5% of people can comply with lifestyle modifications, here's the other big change. The other big change is this, is that ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, calcium channel blockers, and thiazide diuretics are all essentially equal in efficacy and they're all first line therapy. Ding, 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 ding. Next big change, JNC8. Diabetes, the cutoff of blood pressure is 140 over 90. Age over 60, this is a colossal change. A colossal change. You don't notice that our, our books don't talk about pre-hypertension because the world is going the other way around. We don't want grandpa getting hypotensive from our medications and having syncope. The other way around, the blood pressure cutoff is rising because it took us decades to figure out that a blood pressure in an older person is naturally five or 10 points higher than a younger person. It's natural for them. Also, as long as you control the blood pressure, it doesn't matter which one you use, ACE, ARBs, calcium blockers, and thiazides. And the reason I put Losartan, Valsartan, Herbisartan, Candesartan, Losartan, Valsartan, Herbisartan, Candesartan, and the ARBs here, is that you can't add these two together. When do ACE inhibitors and ARBs get combined? Never, we never combine them. Now, here's the other part. If the blood pressure starts out high, super high at 160 over 100, we start with two drugs. Wow, there you go. Hypertension is really easy because it's very evidence-based and it's very cookbooky and it follows guidelines and it follows principles. And those principles are what we have right here. Repeat, repeat, repeat. The cutoffs have changed. They've risen. That used to be 130. That used to be 140. It's risen. Forget about pre-hypertension. Here's the next one. If you have an acute hypertensive crisis, you have hypertensive emergency, hypertensive urgency, accelerated hypertensive, hypertensive crisis, malignant hypertension. It's basically high blood pressure with end organ damage, chest pain, shortness of breath, hypertension, confusion, chest pain, shortness of breath, high tension, confusion, means you're not getting enough perfusion, chest pain, shortness of breath, hypertension, confusion, means you're not getting enough perfusion, acute and organ damage. 30 years ago, we used to use labetalol or nitroprusside. However, now we use labetalol or nitroprusside, labetalol or nitroprusside, or an allopril, or an allopril-at, or an ACE inhibitor. Yes, it's the same. It's the same. Remember, what makes it a hypertensive emergency is not the blood pressure. What makes it a hypertensive emergency is the end organ damage. That's what makes it a hypertensive emergency and urgency. What makes it a hypertensive emergency and urgency is the end organ damage. That's what makes it a hypertensive emergency. So, labetalol, nitroprusside, and allopril, it's end organ damage. And please don't pay attention to people who spend time talking about the difference between accelerated hypertension and hypertensive emergency and crisis and urgency and malignant. It's all bullshit. Forget about it. Are you symptomatic? You having problems thinking? You having problems breathing? You having problems with chest pain? Then it's an emergency, lower the blood pressure. However, the, the maximum that you should lower it in the first day is 25%. That's so much you should lower it in the first day. If you lower it too much, you can cause people to have a stroke. So don't lower it more than 25% in the first day. Our last piece, how can hypertension be this easy? Because it follows a cookbook. That's good. 
how do you know who to evaluate for secondary hypertension? How do you know who to evaluate for secondary hypertension? How do you know to go looking for k k k k k con syndrome, hyper hyperaldosteronism, k k k k k k Cushing syndrome for hypercortisolism, k k k k k k coarctation of the aorta, k k k k k k k k k k k k k k k Closure of the renal artery. How do you know that renal artery stenosis? Closure of the renal artery. How do you know you should go looking for these secondary hypertension? For cons, for Cushing's, for co-arctation in the order, for closure of the renal artery, for acromegaly. Because you should see three things. Number one, they're either young, like they're under 30, or they're over the age of 60 or 70. Because if you made it to be 60 or 70, you shouldn't be starting to have hyper blood high blood pressure in your 70s. Number two, if you're 26, you're not supposed to have high blood pressure. Next, you're not controlled, and after two or three medications, you're still not controlled. Hey, you're an ACE, you're on a calcium blocker, you're on a diuretic and you still have high blood pressure? Hmm, I think there's something in here. And the last is something in the history and physical that tells you. It's a board exam, it's a standardized test. If they want you to know the answer, they have to tell you something. If they want you to know the answer, they have to let you know. So if they want you to know it's Kahn syndrome, they'll tell you hypokalemia, muscle weakness from the hypokalemia, hypokalemia con syndrome from the aldosterone, metabolic alkalosis from the aldosterone, the aldosterone. Man, by this time you should be getting it that says aldosterone makes you excrete potassium, aldosterone makes you excrete hydrogen ions. And that's what makes you go after the renin aldosterone level, the renin aldosterone level. Somebody has a moon faces, they're humping in all the wrong places. They've got hyperlipidemia and all hyperglycemia, and you're too greet, too greasy and too sweet, humping and mooning, humping and mooning, humping and mooning in all the wrong places. Your upper extremity is greater than lower extremity blood pressure. You're big and strong and muy macho up here and the teeny weeny little witty bitty guy down here. Coarctation, cons, cushings, coarctation, closure of the renal artery, ke, 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 contraceptives, which one? A condom tied around the aorta? oral contraceptives. Well, if they want you to know it's closure, renal artery stenosis, a uh, bruit. What's the difference between a noise and a bruit? A noise or a bruit, 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 bruit. Why, everything is sex or in French. Do you want to twist around the point or do you want to torse out the point? Is a bruit, you've got noisy, noisy flanks. We're going to do the sonogram, and then the sonogram, and then you could do the CT angiogram is equal to the magnetic resonance angiogram, is almost equal to the duplex ultrasonogram. They're all about the same. And then we dilate and stent you. Dilate and stent your renal artery, your filthy American fat in your general direction. Your bui. Cons. Cushing's co-arctation. Secondary hypertension. Look for a hairy, hairy woman. Waxing deficiency needs a waxing bed. But not Greek, not Greek. More than Greek, more than Greek. Dr. Paris. Okay, out here. Man, can, can, can. Look for hairy women with big clip Taurus is it's congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Secondary hypertension. Who should we go looking for secondary hypertension? For people who have some history or physical finding that tells you. Cons, Cushing's, 
coarctation, closure of the renal artery, contraceptives, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Now, this is the easy part. This is the last part for this section. Here we just said that ACE, calcium blocker, thiazides are first. I didn't put beta blockers in there. But this is for generic man. Generic man. I'm not young. I'm not old. I don't have diabetes. I don't have myocardial infarction. I don't have congestive failure. I don't have osteoporosis. If you don't have another compelling indication, this is what you use. But if you have a compelling indication, like an MI, then the answer is beta blocker and ACE inhibitor. If you have another compelling indication, like congestive failure, then the answer is beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor. If you have a person with diabetes, then the answer is an ACE inhibitor and an ARB. The minute that you have another compelling indication, we don't do this generic thing about thiazides, calcium blockers, and ACE inhibitors. There's no true compelling indication for calcium blockers. I mean, Raynaud's is a little too vague. Prince metal's a little too rare. But these things about knowing that you don't use calcium blockers if it's an MI or congestive fire, that you don't use calcium blockers and thiazides if it's diabetes, the other compelling indications are indispensable. What's the, you see, we don't use in B, uh, alpha blockers much. Alpha blockers, prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin. Alpha blockers turn out not to be great drugs, get a lot of orthostasis with them. They don't lower mortality in coronary disease. Alpha blockers have serious problems. But if you have prostatic hypertrophy, we're going to use prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin. Prazosin, terazosin, doxazosin, the other compelling indications. High blood pressure will be all through the test. You have symptoms, acute symptoms, chest pain, shortness of breath, confusion, lower the blood pressure with labetalol, nitroprusside, and allopurinol. Don't do it more than 25% in the first day. You don't have compelling indications. Repeat a bunch of times. Blood pressure is not hypertension above the age of 60 till you get to a systolic of 150. Diabetics have the same cutoff as everybody else now. Weight loss is the most effective lifestyle modification. ACE, ARB, calcium blocker, and thiazides are all equal in efficacy for hypertension. That's a colossal change. For 40 years, 50 years, we said thiazides is first. Thiazides were developed by accident in the 1950s while experimenting with uh, antibiotics. They're really a sulfa antibiotic. Most people don't know that. They're a sulfa drug. They're an antibiotic. Sulfa antibiotic. So it's good to have a cookbook. You know, when I was in medical school, the older the doctors were like, that guy's a hack. He practices cookbook medicine. And uh, they're wrong. A guy like me, to be entertaining for medical education, is one thing. And it's good for me to jump up and down so that you remember things. But it would be better if it was done like a cookbook with a checklist, like an airline. You'd never get on an airline that was run like a hospital. You'd never get on an airline where you hope your pilot is smart. You hope your pilot is knowledgeable. Now, it must be, it's nice for me to be me, but it's not convenient. It takes 10 or 15 years to make a Conrad Fisher. The thing to do is to be able to get a good knowledge base. When you run out of knowledge and you don't know stuff, to look stuff up and to go according to systems, guidelines, checklists, and yes, a cookbook. Because we don't want a system that's based on human memory. And I am a human memory animal. Yet... It's not right to actually take care of patients this way. It's right if for memory, because we're trying to be exciting, so you do well on your test and it stays vibrant. But it would be far better if we gave up the illusion of free will in order to protect patients. Because I think that humanity deserves better than what we've been doing as a profession. And I think you can do it. And I need your help. And so does the world.